All right, welcome to the Recruiter Startup Podcast. I've been brought back out of retirement by Tom White. We're going to be celebrating some of the members of our RecWired community. Welcome, Tom, from Five Value. Thank you very much, Sultan. Good pl- pleasure to be here, if I can get my words out. Uh, yeah, looking forward to it. So where, where are you based today, Tom? Uh, so currently in Bristol, in the southwest of the UK. Uh, I would like to say the sun is shining and the weather's good, but unfortunately it isn't shining and it's raining quite heavily, but I uh, still feel pretty chipper, nevertheless. Yeah. Are you from there originally, Tom? Yeah, from the southwest, yeah. So kind of been around a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, been in Bristol since crikey, I think like eighteen years old, I think. Now, yeah. Sell, sell Bristol to me. Why, why is it? Uh, why do people say it's up there as the best city in the UK? Well, I think you already like it, but I think Charlotte's sister used to live here, right? So yeah. I think I, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm selling to a man that's already bought it. Um, yeah. But I think, yeah, in, in general, Bristol's always voted as you know one of the best places to be in the UK. It's quite a bohemian culture. Mm. Um, and we'd like to think actually it's um yeah it's a little bit different to to london it's a little bit less hustle and bustle but some good genuine people trying to trying to earn a crust right so uh yeah i like it people like it yeah nice access to the the southwest which is mm. uh probably the nicest place in england um you know you get the countryside of wales as well big city commuter yeah. to london it's kind of yeah. it takes a lot of boxes right Cotswolds isn't far away, and that seems to be on trend at the moment with Soho Farmhouse and yeah. Jeremy Clarkson's farm. So, uh, yeah, you can get up there in less than an hour. So I think that's a bit of an appeal for people. Very good. Um, all right. So loads to cover today. Um, How would you get into recruitment first? Uh, crikey. So I was working in telecommunication sales, um, selling kind of multiple mobile phone contracts to, to large businesses. And I got called by a rep to rec actually, um, who was selling me the dream of recruitment and um, uh, and talking about certain people in the Bristol area earning good money and the opportunities. Uh, he put me in touch with one company. I had an interview, got the job and, and that was it, right? And um, I've really never looked back since then. Um, but I think it, it suited me because I have a background in technology. So at university I did, uh, I studied two degrees and one of them was in embedded systems, which I ended up recruiting for, for a long time and and still actually is uh, a vein, a rich vein of what we do in in our companies, right? And um, yeah, literally haven't looked back (laughs) since 2008 when I got the job. So that's how I got into it. Were you one of those kids that was sitting building their uh, their own computer at home or? Well, it's funny because I remember when I was 16, I had the chance to have a moped or a laptop. And actually, I got uh, I got a laptop. And I'm glad I did because it was at the time where uh, broadband internet was coming into the homes quite easily. And yeah, I kind of got into computers, right? And I, I think maybe a healthy balance between being a bit of a geek and, you know, uh, and actually having some social skills as well, right? Um, and yeah, just really enjoyed it. Um, and, and at that time, and all my mates when we were at uni, all we wanted to do was kind of get free TV and free games and all the rest of it. So, um, yeah, kind of got into that side of it, which, which has served me really well over the years. So, uh, got into recruitment. How long did it take you to get good at it? Uh, I think after my first year, uh, I started to really uh, kind of outstrip maybe other people in the business. Um, but I think really from day one, I, I I was good at getting leads. It was good at finding out information. And um, yeah, I think just in general with sales, it was, it, was, it was a bit like a duck to water, right? And I know that sounds probably a little bit big headed, but if I look back now to some of the things that I was doing and actually the kind of new starters that I've seen in my business and a lot of other companies, there's just an affinity to it. And I think sometimes people have that. It just seems to fit quite well. So first year, I think I did about 120, 130 um, cold desk, no experience in contract, um, and then peaked at about 1 million, 1.2 million um, on about 60 contractors uh, as a consultant. So yeah, quite, quite, quite a quick rise, yeah. On those uh, on that new starter element, 
you said there was an affinity. What 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 were the characteristics? Or it sounds to me like you're describing things that create trust. I think there's a few elements. Um, primarily, you need to have an innate sense of drive and determination. And, and I think that has to go further. I think you need to have a bit of a chip on your shoulder and, and a point to prove. Because this is a this is a tricky job in the sense that you have to keep going and going and going. And there's a lot of people that I believe want to do it, tell themselves that they can do it, impress an interview that say they can do it. But in the cold light of day, they're just not willing to keep going long enough to do it. So I think the characteristics for me are a drive um, and an incredible sense of resilience and determination. And that beats everything else. You don't need to be the best salesperson. You don't need to be super bright. You have to have a reason for doing it and be bloody sure that you're going to go after it day after day. What what type of things do you do to uncover that chip on the shoulder? It sounds quite cliche, but Simon Sinek said it really famously in Finding the Why, right? But I think you really need to drill down as to why people want to do this. Mm. Re recruitment is a beautiful industry, but also can attract nefarious characters as well as people that sometimes can be a bit aimless um so i think you really need to kind of uncover what people hope to get out of this and what is the driving factor behind them deciding to take a role in this industry because it's all about you know the success and the bonus that's uh given you know i mean we're we're big on values right clearly given the name and, and profit and purpose um, but equally, our business and every other business in Bristol in the UK, the vast majority of how we celebrate success is on the commission or the bonus element that's paid. Yeah. So you've got to want to earn um, and maybe spend to keep earning, but you've got to want to earn um, in order to do it. So I think it's really driving down into that why to say, uh, why this as opposed to a job that may have a higher base, but less, you know, on target earning potential and, and why do you really want to do it? And why do you really want to do that? It's like the five why questions, right? Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's primarily what we would look for. Yeah. I can, I can relate to maybe my own why at 27 getting into it and needing a visa for Australia, for example, that was right. a why. Then it was probably time to get that proper professional professional job despite having some qualifications and all the rest there's another why and another chip on the shoulder and then it was oh i'm in here with a bunch of 22 year olds and i'm 27 or 26 i should be further along than these guys oh they're my boss okay that's a chip on the shoulder you steer into that you fight you fire into that do you do you have a way of uncovering that in the interview that why with when you're look when you're going through your graduates so i think i think it's um it's trying to have a personal contract with someone. So um, I actually picked this up listening to a podcast about six months ago, and and I hadn't really labelled it as a personal contract. But when I was listening to someone talk about having a personal contract, it 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 kind of rang true. So we have a job description, and people can say yes, I can do X, Y, and Z on the job description. But it's but it's almost about having a frank conversation to say. I'm going to pay you X and I'm going to train you and coach you. And 50% of your success is based on, on our ability to instill the traits and support systems that you'll have around you to do it. And 50% is on your ability to keep getting after it. Yeah. And I think having that frank level conversation uh, straight to the point um, really can separate the uh, kind of interview interviewee situation that you have sometimes in this artificial situation of uh, them trying to impress you and you trying to impress them by painting yeah. a good picture of the business. So I, I, I guess in short, it's just like, you know, it, to be frank, it's just having a no bullshit conversation to say, yeah. look, do you really want to do this? Why do you really want to do this? And really uncover it and and and, and actually feel and, and, and vis viscerally feel that what they're telling you is the truth um and and again that's really hard to kind of distill or the bottle but you get a you get a sense and then you, know, you look for elements of of why that's the case and so on but um 
I think sometimes when you look into the whites of someone's eyes and you really get into it, you'll know if they really want it or not. And uh, and that's why I always like the term, you know, it's a hell yeah or a no on hiring. You yeah, know, you have to, you have to walk out and think I'm hiring this person because I believe that they really want it, and I'm convinced. Um, but if you get any doubt in that, just don't bother doing it. If I could just fast forward to something I just saw recently, you've been nominated as one of the judges on the for the for the panel of the the rec industry awards yeah that's right yeah so uh yeah the recruiter awards uh yeah so i'm i'm a judge yeah so uh yeah very very excited uh, so about that where, where do i pay you for my award <laughs> <laughs> would, would you know what it, it's good that you brought this up actually because um there's a misconception i think with awards that people feel as though you uh you can buy yourself into it and whose palm do i have to lace right yeah. um but actually when i've gone through this process and i've seen it uh the guys at the recruiter awards are incredibly fair there's no kind of cross contamination or conflicts of interest uh yeah you've got to buy a table but you've got to buy a table and any awards right yeah and cl sure. cl cl clearly these guys need to to wash their face and try and make some money out of this as well because we're all in this to to try and make a living um, but ultimately, it was an honour to be asked. We won an award this year for the best recruitment company in the UK for our size at the Recruiting Investing in Talent Awards. And uh, I was also shortlisted for some entrepreneurial awards for, for other bits and pieces. And that was how it was picked up, right? Um, but the process is quite the process is quite intensive. So, you know, you, you really have to go through a lot of information, a lot of award entries, um, and take the time to do it in a fair and kind of orthodox manner so in fact funny enough i actually went through it on the weekend i finished it off and it probably took me four to six hours to digest all the information um but it's quite heartwarming to see the, like the level of care and attention that you have from businesses of varying sizes uh smaller to larger businesses that that really give a shit about what they're doing you know and and, and it pours out of the page so um yeah, it was really it was really good to 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 be asked to to judge that. Uh, is there a specific category you're judging? I don't know if I can say that. All uh, oh, right, but, uh, but I, I yeah, there are two that I've been asked, um, but I'm not sure if I can, so I don't want to drop myself in it. But yeah, <laughs> uh, there, there, there's two there's two categories that I've been asked to to judge. Yeah, I yeah. can I can say that. Sorry, dog. <laughs> no, that's all right. Look, my head it, my head's in learning and development at the moment quite a bit because we've just launched the Rackwired Plus platform, and it's been a build for quite a period of time, and you know we're we're at the customer success piece now. We're we're putting all the pieces together and it's a it, it i've learned a lot over the last couple of years with your own learning and development program in house how do you how do you get the average people or how do you get people from zero to making money how do you get the people from making money to being great what what, what, what do you think what is that process and what distinguishes things along the way yeah that's the multi-million dollar question, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't think we've got it perfect. Yeah. I don't I don't think anyone's got it perfect. I think all you can really do is try to be better. Yeah. You know, try to be better than yesterday and 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 really uh see it as an iterative process. From our own business, we have a learning and development director. We have an induction module that takes 12 weeks, a mixture of classroom and desk side coaching. Uh, where we go through recruitment training and sales training. Um, and it's modular and we try not to load people up too much, uh, but equally we really let themselves, let them know what they're in for, right? Because yeah. if it's not going to work, you want it to kind of fail fast. Does that make sense? So, sure, you, you know, you, you know, just want people to go, actually, this is not for me, but thanks for thanks very much all the same, because it's no good for them in the long term. It's no good for us from an investment of time and money perspective. Um, so that's the kind of up and running. And our kind of mantra is that we want to see someone produce the placement within 12 weeks and then have sure. the consistency after that to try and be, you know, to have uh, a placement a month or, or more. Right. So yeah. I think most businesses have an aspiration for two DPH. Um, yeah. But if they're really honest, they're probably not at two, VA, two DPH. And, and if they say that they are, they're probably posturing. And it's probably definitely not, not this year. Yeah. 
Probably not. Definitely not last year. Yeah. Um, the good to great is an interesting one. So just to touch on good to great. So good to great is um, takes a lot more thought, time, dedication. It's unlocking that extra why. It's uh, removing the complacency around, you know, you're earning, you know, I don't know, five to 10 grand a month in commission. What's going to get you to the next phase? You know, um, how do you want to become more consistent? Do you want to go into management, et cetera? Um, it's also looking at external ways that you can improve that. So we have a professional development fund. So everyone has um, a four figure sum per year that they can spend on coaching and development that helps them within their role, right? So actually, we would look at external support as well. So it's a different voice. It's a different platform. It's a different sweep. I know you guys are just obviously producing something at the moment. Um, and there's lots of other coaches and trainers out there. And, and I think that injection, um, different voice, sometimes off-site, um, can be like a pattern interrupt yeah, um, and change behaviours and hopefully get to the next phase. But I don't think there's a... There, there's a like an ironclad way. Um, uh, you just you just have to try and do your best by by the people that you've got um, and take the time to listen and 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 try and help. I don't know if that answers your question either. <laughs> Hopefully, it does a bit. It, le- it leads to my next one because uh, one of the things you said there was just about the business taking responsibility for it as well. Um, I'm a good believer in that. The business business responsibility should be in terms of marketing and tech. Like I, I, I like to take away as much of that from the recruiter as possible. And the business engine should be there to feed the recruiter to be on the phone and to be building relationships as much as possible. Um with the release of Chat GPT4 and with your tech head on now, like we've just Basically, they've said they've wiped out customer services jobs, even just with that new new thing. Where, where, where do you see the future of jobs and maybe the recruitment industry coming and, and our part in the next three, four, five, beyond? Um, changing jobs is the second most rewarding and stressful thing that you can do, right? Yeah, no, just... Moving houses, number one. Correct, yeah. So I think ultimately people want to talk to someone. People want to to have the opinion of someone that they trust and that they built a relationship with. Um, and that would be really hard to replace by AI. You know, the reason why people listen to Jay Rayner as a restaurant, uh, a restaurant critic or Jeremy Clarkson, as I mentioned earlier, on his yeah. column, right, is because they like the tonality. They like the opinion, the fact. Now, AI can try and mimic that. And we've seen that with deep fakes on, on the Internet and, mm. you know, music that's been, you know, produced seemingly by, by people that aren't around anymore. But yeah. we, we know it's not real. So I think it's probably, and I hopefully think it's probably one of, one of the last industries to really um, be truly uh, affected from, from AI. Uh, and I think we need to look back at actually the computer. So when the computer came around, typewriters were worried about their jobs and were worried about actually where they lose their jobs and so on. Mm. But the reality was the actual level of pro- productivity was expected to increase. So I think we see AI now as a tool to increase productivity and to increase the ability to match people from say boolean searching etc but that process of negotiating and and looking at deep human psyche emotions and so on uh i i just don't believe that people will want a computer to do that for them yeah today well we are this is a b2b interaction right now would you want your AI and my AI to be doing this instead of two people having a connection. And I get, so I, I get that. But what jobs are people going to be recruiting for? That's my bigger worry. Like we're, when, when, cause you're in, you're in the tech detail. I'm not right. So yeah. what, what are your clients saying about the future of their hiring needs? Like is code going to be written by itself is like, where, where do you see all of that going? Yeah, I, I do believe that there's an element of coding that's going to be um, produced through large language models and, and GPTs, as you've mentioned, um, but almost a slight change in focus around uh, the rise of product 
and, and project management within technology development lifecycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, certain uh, coding princi principles and, yeah. you know, like refactoring of code or obfuscation for security purposes, et cetera, you know, that, that will likely be done by AI and language models. Um, but you're still going to need someone to uh, to manage that project, project and and to really join it together and to know that it's done in, in the right way. And I think we're 10, 20 years off actually, uh, you know, budget controllers saying, I'm gonna I'm gonna rely on the computer to make the right decision. Mm. Um so I think the more kind of uh basic elements uh will likely uh have an AI counterpart or uh, be enhanced by AI, um, but there's still going to be lots of room for people to ensure that product, projects are successful, in, in my humble opinion, and yeah. from people I've spoken to. Yeah, cool. I, I follow, uh, do you follow the All In podcast? No, no. no. For uh, venture capitalists, billionaire friends, um, sit down, put the world to rights once a week. It's really good. And uh, one of the things that, you know, you pick, I picked up from that is, they're saying that it is the the cost to get a project up now is greatly less because the human element is smaller. So are we hoping that there's going to be more projects? So there'll be more humans and jobs. So we'll be able to recruit it. Or are, are we worried that there'll be less actual jobs to do the recruitment and that, we as recruiters have to be super specialist in in what we do in owning that space. Hmm. Yeah, um, I don't expect you to have the answer, <laughs> but it's a it, it, it's it's one of those ones that would keep me up at night. I think I think yeah, I, I, it's a really good point, and it's um, quite existentialist in terms of a question, right? But I I, I would say specifically in technology is that. Uh, you know, there's no stopping the train of technology. Like every business will be a technology business that just yeah. so happens to clean cars or, or you know, fix uh, computers or, you know, make shelves in the, at home, right? And so every computer, uh, every business will be a technology business. And yeah. also those businesses will also be a media business, right? Um, so it's, the, it's those two things in parallel. So I think you, you're fairly robust in terms of recruitment within technology. Um, at any level, you just need to make sure that you're you're able to pivot, and you can pivot really quickly in this industry because it's not like we have a factory or we have a product line. It's all services based, and so conversations like this and speaking to people where uh, you might need to um, to move into you know a, into a slightly different area can be done really qu really quickly. And look at the amount of people trying to jump on the AI bandwagon at the moment in terms of recruitment, yeah. right? You know, it's just like it's colossal. And I get it, and I understand it. And some people yeah. are having great successes for it. So um, it's such a versatile industry that I think, yeah, I think I think we'll be all good in the long term. Um, one of the things you said there about like a recruitment company needs to be a media business. Um, I've I've bought into that for many years now. Um, I go a step further. I I think we probably need to look at all the things we can do for our customer base, and I've tried to do that with setting up Recwired. You know, know the L and D platform, being a reseller, having a Rec Direct business, trying to look at the customer like what what is everything that you need from the initiation to the exit in your business and how can I play a part in that? Do you do you look at your own business now that you've got the media side as well as the media side is there to build relationships just to give you temp and perm or are you looking at new products and services and offerings to give your clients? Yeah, uh, but firstly, I think you've you've done a really good job, right, uh, with Red Wide and, and the communities that you've developed. Uh, you know, active debate and active engagement, which is up, which is the whole point, and and actually and actually quite hard to drive, right? You can build it, but is it going to be a machine that carries on itself? Um, I completely agree on the media side. So, so Five D Media, one of our brands, um, is quite special. So it partners with a lot of conferences, trade shows. It produces its own content, produces podcasts. Um, you know. 
for years, people have been saying in the recruitment industry, you can't just post jobs and expect to get engagement. People know your recruitment business, right? They, they don't just want to see you posting jobs. They want to see you engaging within the industry. So we have a mantra that we're part of the industry. We're not just servicing it. Um, and what does that mean? Well, it means that you are a thought leader within the industries that you serve. Um, you know, I run an IoT podcast. It's the number one in the world. Um, you have up to 10,000 people that view it per month. Um, we've had companies like Huawei and, and Deloitte sponsor it. Um, and I've seen other people do the same. So I think you you need to be ingrained within the industry and you need to be media savvy enough in order to produce good content that people are going to watch and and look at it from slightly different angles about how you can also monetize this. So sponsorships, um, SEO, you know, pay-per-view, subscription models, et cetera, um, because there's a lot more that we can be doing. And I think there's a lot of great recruiters out there that have yet to find their voice in terms of how they can be an analyst within their industry as well. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a recruiter that's speaking to, you know, a thousand Java developers every month, right, you know, then they have know a lot about Java development and they know a lot about the ebbs and flows of it. So they could be an analyst within that movement, but they need to find their voice. So um, I, I think in the future, you'll see a lot more recruitment businesses certainly um, push out more content, which is genu genuinely engaging and not just posting pictures on lunch clubs and stuff, right? Yeah. It's a it's a bit of a process to to learn how to do it right. I think. Mm. Uh, where was it going with my next one? The USA. Mm -hmm. um, you went in when the market was hot, and you you gambled, and you <laughs> survived. But talk to me about because I I interviewed Mark Tanowski a few times on here. He's a great guest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he said, people don't realize how much money it takes to do it right. Yeah. And it's a lot harder than they think to go and crack it and scale it and do it properly. And then I asked him to break it down and he did and he broke it down numerically. And I was like, oh, okay, I think I'll go and move to Gibraltar instead of America. Um, talk to me about the journey. So uh, we're still at the start of our journey with the US, yeah. uh, but we, we've started to, to to land some consistent placements with some, some good businesses in our ecosystem. And, and yeah, of course, those placements, the fee values are three, four times what you'd see in Europe, which is which is colossal. Um, I think if you're going to do US, and again, in my humble opinion, I know Mark and uh, Zengtel, I think his business, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know he sits on the board at a, a few good companies. I think if you're going to go over there, yes, it's going to cost a lot of money because the salaries are so much higher. You know, what you pay consultants as a base has to be high. You know, grads are on fifty, sixty thousand dollars depending on which state you're on. But I think the thing that kind of uh, really sums it up for me is that like the only similarity between the US and the UK really is apparently we speak the same language. Yeah. So if you, if, you, if you go if you go in with that mantra, it's 52 different countries, uh, lots of laws, complications, et cetera. And you've really got to break down those doors. So I think when you're specialist and you have a voice which transcends across countries, either for a media angle or for a technology vertical or industry, uh, you can start really, really small. But for me, it's about focusing in a certain area, being really, really good at it, being persistent and then starting to mushroom out after that. I see a lot of people trying to tackle the US. They go, oh, I'm going to break the US. It's like, well, East Coast, West Coast, what state, what city? You know, uh, it's it's colossal. So, um, so my advice and how we've done it is to look at our UK European clients who have a base in the US where we've already got terms, uh, start to look at where they are um, uh, geographically and start to build out around that. Um, and then start to lead gen off the back of it. So our video business does a lot of work in, in New York. Um, and that's nice because there's a kind of hive of activity when it comes to video and streaming in New York. A 5B tech business does a lot of work in Austin. And again, you know, Austin's, you know, ever since Tesla put the Gigafactory there, like years ago, it's been quite a hub for, you know, the electronics industry, for, for what we serve. 
So it, it's starting small, starting with what you know, and then mushrooming out. I think if you're going to go over there, you need the funds, right? And um, you need to incubate teams from the UK for a period of time, get them up to speed, and you hire them on the basis that they're going to go over there. Um, uh, and, that's, and that's really early doors, right? You know, you start asking questions about family moves and so on and so forth. Um, or you don't. Right. Or you just simply do not ever move over there, but you're over there, say, on a quarterly basis, meeting people for a couple of weeks. And you take advantage of the fact that you're selling a service at a lower cost to a country with a higher GDP in the same way that, you know, uh, outsourcing companies in India or in Eastern European countries like Poland, for instance, will sell services in the UK. You don't see them touting for business in Poland or India. Right. You know, they do it in the UK because that's that's their model. So you could do that equally from here. So it depends on your aspirations of the business and where you want to get to, um, in my in my view. Um, just back to the recruiter awards. Um, when you're skimming through all the different applications, um, what what type of stuff's impressing you uh, from founders? And like, are you being reflective on your own journey and uh, what you were like when you were at that stage? And he gives a bit more insight on what's going on in your head. Um, I think it's looking for things that are above and beyond the norm. So, you know, everyone can talk about uh, having a good candidate care experience or, you know, a good um, route to market, but substantiate that, right? Show me, and it, show me more than one example. Uh, you know, if if there's a blog on your website that talks about people moving from one country to the other, well, that's great. There's one blog. When was it written? Two years ago? Well, that's not really very good, right? Show me 20 blogs. Show me engagement. Show me N NPS, ENPS scores, etc. So it's it's really putting it at the heart of what you're trying to do. Mm. Um, and that can be challenging. We're called five values. The values that we have has to be ingrained within our processes as well as making profit. And that's really challenging. But ultimately, it serves us in the right way. And for certain businesses, depending on their mission statement, I'm personally trying to link the mission statement with what they're doing along with the financial aspect. But there has to be more than just simply saying, we do this, show me you do it 10, 15 different ways. And then I believe that it's really ingrained in your business. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Give me evidence. Um, as opposed to you've just collected some of this data for this award and then you're going to just... Go go about your business, putting in quick deals as and when you can. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Um, re really interesting, and people have to be really robust with their with their applications now, right? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, certain certain people you can you can tell the people that really want it and really care, um, and put a lot of it thought and 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 care into that process, but equally. There's some smaller businesses who may not have the resources to do it. Mm. So one of one of the things that, which is interesting from, from judging, and this is the first time I've judged a recruiter awards category, right? And, and as I say, I'm honoured, but but equally you have to be kind of pragmatic. So if you've got a business with 200 million turnover, you know, doing 10 million EBITDA, right? Then they're going to have massive amounts of resources. So I have to look at what they produce compared to the business of 12 people that still founder led. And say, well, well, who's doing more, really, right? Um, and that's 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 sometimes hard to quantify. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's like businesses can do more, but so they should, right? So uh, yeah, it, it, it for me, it, I really took it, I really took it very seriously, and I wanted to make sure that I was giving a, a, as honest and as kind of thoughtful. Um, kind of answers to it because it's it's a big thing and uh if people are taking the time and an effort to to apply then it, then at least me being one of the you know 15 20 judges or whatever you know we should absolutely take the time to go through it in in detail you know um just just to finish up talk to me a little bit about your company's strategic roadmap uh what an ideal outcome looks like and who is there in the business to steel man you check you make sure that everything's done right and you're accountable yeah great question um so we have a senior leadership team most businesses do um 
And uh, we also have values committees that, that meet and talk about, are we staying true to what we say that we're going to do? Um, the strategic kind of direction longer term is, well, you know, I'm 40 next year. Uh, I've been doing this for quite a long time. You know, I'd like to have an event of some description um, around 20, 28, 29, depending on what it looks like at the time. There's anything like 23 or probably probably hold out for a year or so. Um, but yeah, I I think the strength, the strength of us lies not just within me as a founder, it's really making me redundant and letting the SLT run the business and and empowering them to become an effective team. But the strategic direction overall is to get somewhere between um, 60 and 100 staff um, and be really good at what we do um, and happy, motivated people that are living the values and, and producing results day in, day out. And, and if we can achieve that, then I think it would be a very interesting proposition for someone someday. Yeah. Just on that 60 to 80 staff, when you're do- looking at the makeup of that, are you... Is, is there a certain ratio that, that you work off in terms of back office to actual billers or non-billers to billers? Yeah, great, great question. Most people talk about six to one. Uh, that tends to be the number that gets banded around, right? So six yeah. billers to one back office. I think when that, you're... That yours isn't. No, of course not. And, and probably most businesses aren't. Yeah. Um, but it also it, it's also very different. So you talk about six to one, you know, you're talking 10, 15 years ago. Well, you know, I didn't have a media brand, right? Uh, I didn't have a marketing team that are producing content and, and washing its own face of what they're doing. So um, I don't think there's an ideal number. I think what, what's important is when you're looking at P&L and you're looking through indirect salaries and it's non-sales, but it's like, well, where are we with what we've set within the budget? How much of that is the machine that's making it going um, and are those people busy and being effective and fulfilled? Yeah, cool, great. Then we keep going, right? Um, I don't think there's ever going to be a world where you'd have 50-50 because that seems a bit idiotic, right? Especially when we've got, you know, AI and various yeah, you know, things exactly. to help us as we spoke earlier. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the answer is. I just I just think you need, need to be uh, prag- pragmatic with how many people that you have in non-billing and, and are they being effective and you know, would would you suffer without them? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've gone through the exercise recently, um, right. and it, it's who is actual business critical right now? Because I had a look at the P and L, and I was like, we got we got a bit bloated, like because things are nice, and then when the market changed, it's mm. like, well, wow, who who's absolutely essential? where can we shift somebody what can we do how can we make all this thing work together um and and you soon you soon find out once you once you put to it you know so it's uh it's it's a good check to go through is there is there any way we, that, that that you've ran any checks like that yourself in your own business is like in terms of keeping costs under control whenever that dip happened um it's funny you just know, yeah, it's funny. It's funny. No, it's funny you should say that because uh, we just booked in a detailed overheads analysis, right? Mm. So I think businesses should probably look at doing this on a quarterly basis. I think any any that more that's too... yeah, I think so. I think you can get carried away, right? And yeah. you get car- carried away with rec tech and oh, it's only twenty quid. It's only a hundred quid. It's yeah. like well, oh, one know, more t- deal. One yeah, more. yeah, one more deal. Yeah, but then times that by fifty, and that deal doesn't come in, and you're still paying on the service for three years, right? And do you really need it? Is it a luxury, right? So I think you need to be honest with yourself with regards to that. Um, but there's two forces at play. You know, you want to get the business to um, a process and scale to where it should be and where it wants to be. Um, uh, but it, so you have to think forward thinking in terms of what you need um, in order to ramp up with people but equally where you are today. So it would be wrong for me to have, you know, three, four people in L&D for the size of my business. Uh, but I need someone in L&D, right? Um, and at some point, we'd look at hiring trigger points for sales to then look at how that interacts with back office and what the need is. Um, I, I, I don't, you know, I think fact and sentiment are two different things. So, you know, you have factually, you have to look at the numbers and what you're producing. And then there's an element of sentiment to say, well, it's probably about time that we add someone into the compliance team or whatever, because we're doing that many invoices or that many checks or whatever. 
but there's different ways to, there's different ways to skin a cat, of course, as well, yeah. right? So there's a lot of back office teams now uh, that are outsourcing all of their employment liabilities to umbrella companies and EORs, right? So that saves a lot of cut down in terms of time. You know, you have an MSA with some of these businesses and you just run them through. And in fact, you don't need to do all the ID checks, et cetera, right? So do you therefore need a big team? Do you outsource that team? You know, do you do you take it to, you know, the Philippines or to India or to wherever? A lot of companies are doing that. So I think you need to focus on, on your business, how you want to do it, um, uh, but make sure that you are being realistic with your costs, not going over the top on it and building something for tomorrow, because unless you build it for tomorrow, it will never come. A mm. uh, couple of questions to finish up. If uh, if it was day one again, what would you change? What would you have done differently if you could pick one thing? Um, mm -mm, I would have come off tools sooner. How much sooner? And why? Um, I think that, that sometimes the limitation in, this, in the, the robustness of the consistency in sales comes from the founder not coming off the tools sooner and being able to coach and develop others to produce the results. How much sooner? Uh, by the end of the first year, uh, founders probably shouldn't be looking to place any people if they're scaling their business. Wow. Uh, where have you heard that from? That's that I've never heard that before. No, that's just my view on it, right? You know, if yeah. you're looking to scale, if you're looking to scale the business and you're going to grow and you get six to eight consultants in in the first year yeah. or what have you, uh, then the six to eight should be producing the results of the founder, right? Because if yeah. you think about it, hundred to hundred forty k, six yeah. to eight people, best part of a million founders probably doing five hundred thousand because they're also sending out the invoices, etc. So, so really, that should be replaced at that point so that you can work on the business rather than in the business. But I think it's really hard to take. Yeah, take yourself out, and I and I'm still involved in quite a few processes today um, because it's because it's something that I enjoy. Uh, but sometimes I do have to say to myself, "Is that a limitation?" Yeah. Um, That's it. You know what? Like, because from day one, we're coached about control and controlling every element, and you you're kind of coaching somebody there to go against all their instincts to give up. Because if you give up that billing control as an early founder, you're losing your direct contact maybe with the the clients. The you know you're at risk of maybe them stealing your business. Like there's a lot of those are a lot of things. How how do you mitigate that? Is, is well, that the it, media piece is it? It, well, it, dep it depends what you want, right? If you're going to scale the business to an exit, uh, or you want to, if you want a lifestyle business, that's not the right thing. But if you're going to scale the business, you want to grow it, then, you know, your your connections, your deals should get you up in the air, but your team should be flying it, right? Yeah. Um, and if that's not the case, then there's something probably wrong. And I'm not to say that we're at that point. Like, we're not. And and sometimes when, you know, the shit hits the fan and you have a bad year, like, you need to literally roll up your sleeves and pick up the phone to some people. And also, sometimes those people want to talk to you because they don't want to deal with the guy that's only been here six, nine months, right? Yeah. Um, so there's elements of that. But I think... How do you mitigate against uh, kind of like business protection? Well, I think firstly, you know, you need to uh, not be reactive. So you need to treat people fairly, pay them well enough so that they don't want to leave. Because actually, if they want to leave and some, you know, do their own thing, then they will. Um, and you should probably have a different view on it in the sense that if people want to leave in three, four years time, but they produce good money and results for you during that period of time and they want to do their own thing, then maybe see it as them graduating through your business, right? Yeah. Rather than seeing them leaving your business because at the end, you're the only one that's going to be feeling the anguish and pain of that. Yeah. Um, I think also if you look, you know, to also moving forward, I mean, we're probably going to remove competition laws in the UK in the future. So, yeah. you know, the US has obviously done it. We've spoken about it quite a few times here. Um, you know, I think they're lobbying for it. So I think you just need to be quite minded around that. Uh, busy, and, and then the other, the last thing I would say about keeping the relationship. So it would be illogical for your top billing client for you not to go and meet them. So you need to have a process in the business whereby the relationship sits at consultant, team lead, sales director, CEO level, depending on spend. And a lot of businesses would do that. And it's quite a wise thing to do because in a company that you're knocking in 10 deals with a month, if you haven't got out and met them and actually kept that relationship, um, then one day that might go with a consultant. So uh, there's lots of different measures, I think. Awesome advice to finish up. We could probably drill down on that on another podcast when I get you back on. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. Best of luck for the future. Thank, Thank you. you.
I appreciate it. It's been great fun. All right, take care.